and recording. Great, I think. <laughs> um, now we're going to back to share screen. That was the best. Back that to PowerPoint. Great. I mean, we haven't really started. We just talked about what we're going to talk about. So there we go. Um, and OK, we did all this. We're back through this. All right. So because some of you guys picked critter, critters that are like, before the dinosaurs. Now we have to talk about this stuff instead of just talking about the Mesozoic. So we're gonna talk about the Paleozoic, which is what came before the dinosaurs. Um, and Paleozoic means ancient life. And you have all these different periods. We're gonna go blast through them all really quick. But we open with, does anybody know? Well, I'll just go for it. The Cambrian explosion, which is one of my favorite things that anybody's ever talked about. It's super fun. Um, it's definitely my name for a band if I ever have start a band. Um, and what it was is basically, yes, question. Chat, where's the chat? Boop, 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 boop. Oh, that is our team trivia name, that's right, because it's such a cool name. Um, so basically all of life was like, there's life before this, but like for whatever reason the Cambrian, it just kind of went nuts. It all started experimenting. It's possible that oxygen levels got really high, but life just started like getting more complex, getting more interesting. Um, it was 540 to 485 million years ago. Um, it was very complex multiple multicellular life. There were early arthropods, which are animals with joints, basically, like insects now are considered arthropods, arachnids are arthropods, crabs are arthropods, but it was like the first arthropod showed up and um, and also there's an eons video about this if you want to learn about the Cambrian explosion later. Um, oh, another thing I forgot to mention when I talked about how old life has been on Earth, just something that I think really blows people's minds as a good like fact to start out with is that all of us here today live closer in time to Tyrannosaurus Rex than Tyrannosaurus did to Stegosaurus. So it's like, kind of like, yeah, like we have, there's been a lot of stuff. It's been, life's been around for a long time. Anyway. That's the Cambrian explosion. Uh, no, Colin, that's true. That is not bullshit. That is definitely true. We are closer T-Rex than T-Rex was to Stegosaurus. So um, we're going to start with this little guy that Blade picked. Is Blade even here? I didn't see him. I'm sorry if you're, if you're not here, Blade. Um, uh, anyway, this is Opabinia, and it's a fun little example of why the Cambrian explosion was so crazy is because, like, all these little guys, like life didn't know what the heck it was doing. It was just experimenting. And this little thing had five eyes um, and like this grasping proboscis thing, but it, that's not even its mouth. Its mouth is like hidden under its like down here. So it just grabs stuff with this thing and then stick it under here and swim around. It wasn't very big. It's only like a few inches long, but it is like just this little alien that was swimming around. And like everything in the Cambrian kind of looks like that. It's all just these weird little things. Like life was just like, I don't know, five eyes. I don't know, this thing, we'll figure it out. Um, and so that's kind of why it's really fun. Uh, yeah, um, this thing just kind of, how does this thing exist? It just did. It was um, one of the things that came out of the Cambrian explosion. Um, and uh, it ate like just, on the seafloor, kind of just ate detritus and soft little critters and stuff. It was, you know, just a little thing, bottom feeder. It's probably related to the early arthropods. Um, and it's also possibly, and this one's for Steph because she asked, related to tardigrades. Um, it might be an, like kind of tangentially related to tardigrades. So uh, kind of interesting little thing. Um, then we're next, we're going to move to the trilobites. If you didn't know, I really like trilobites because I uh, actually, if you can see me, I have a trilobite here. It's not really showing up, but there's a look, an actual trilobite. And, um, there you go too. and I have one forever uh, tattooed on my back. So uh, trilobites are great. Um, and uh, they lived for a really long time. They lived from the Cambrian all the way to the end of the Permian. So they really survived all these mass extinctions. There were some of the earliest arthropods. Um, they kind of just crawled around in the muck and just, you know, did whatever. Um, they were not roaches because they were not insects, but they kind of looked like roaches. Max hates trilobites. I think they're awesome. Max is wrong. 
Um, but yeah, and they would also, when they got like scared or like this like thing come up, they would, a lot of them could curl up into little balls. And they were all these different shapes. Some were really big, some were little, some had spikes. They all had like cool stuff. Oh yeah, Amanda says she meant surviving through anything. Yeah, they survived like through tons of stuff before they died out. So they were, they were great. Yeah, they're kind of like pill bug, you know, crawly roachy things. They're, they're kind of fun, kind of cute. Um, lots of different kinds. I said that already. I survived many mass extinctions. I said that already. And there's a whole Eons video about trilobites, if you want to know about trilobites. So um, that's trilobites. So after the Cambrian, we move into the Ordovician. Um, and that's 485 to 444 million years ago. Um, yes, Rick agrees, PBS Eons is great. Um, so in the Ordovician, you start getting the first early fish. You get cephalopods which are squids and ammonites and octopi and tentacly things. Um, and you start getting the very first insects that they don't really have wings. They're, they're just kind of starting to crawl on land. They probably look like silverfish. They weren't, they were, but they were starting to get some early insects too. And coral. Um, the Ordovician ends with the first mass extinction, which was possibly caused by the early plants that were getting onto land and kind of screwing with like basically breaking down the earth and sending a bunch of sediments in the ocean that's changed oxygen levels and screwed everything up. So um, anyway, uh, that's the first big old mass extinction. The plants kind of caused all this trouble. And those plants weren't even plants, they were just like mosses and, and slime and muck. I would like to actually call those plants would be a little generous, but they were like the first plants. Um, so some fun things in the Ordovician. This one's for Sarah, because Sarah said she wanted to talk about horseshoe crabs. And so these are Eurypterids, which are related to horseshoe crabs, which are what they call sea scorpions. Um, there were some small ones, but some really big ones. They weren't actually related to scorpions. They were um, uh, kind of their own weird thing. Um, probably that includes the largest arthropods ever. So some of these got to be eight feet long. So you would not want to be scuba diving with these they would really be pretty freaky. Um, and uh, they are related to horseshoe crabs and early arachnids, but they were kind of off on their own thing. They weren't like true scorpions. Um, Alex and Jack ask, can you surf on one? I don't know. They've got those claws, guys. I don't, I don't know about that. Um, and there's a whole video on eons about Eurypterids, if you want to learn about Eurypterids. Um, so then also horseshoe crabs, did, the first horseshoe crabs also showed up in this time. They are, so horseshoe crabs have been around for 450 million years. Um, they haven't really changed that much. So they're kind of awesome. Um, they have blue blood, if you didn't know this, that's used for testing pharmaceutical contamination. So they actually used, they now are just finally starting to change this, but they, um, they harvest these for, uh, you know, to test pharmaceuticals. Um, the larger females are a little bigger and they breed with several smaller males. The males kind of attach themselves to the females and they all breed. Um, and they're not true crabs, they're kind of in their own family. And they mostly eat worms and mollusks and that's horseshoe crabs. Uh, Garrett asks, who would win in a fight, a trilobite or a horseshoe crab? Um, I don't know, it depends on if it was a big trilobite or a little trilobite. Also, they don't really, I feel like a horseshoe crab might win. I don't know. They both kind of just eat little mucky things and don't really want to eat each other. But I guess Anna says the trilobites could swarm. So that's possible. I don't know. Um, how big do horseshoe crabs get? Asks Steph. I, this is actually a question I don't really know. I've never seen a live horseshoe crab. I think they are like horseshoe size though, aren't they? Like the size of a horseshoe shoe. Is that right? Um, Collins is look. I don't know. Um, I was gonna say that's better. Uh, they're, they're pretty sizable. They're definitely bigger than horseshoes. Wait, hold this up again. Yeah, oh, I want to say they're about the size of my dinosaur head. Okay. Um, the tail yeah. They're actually pretty big and creepy as hell. Cool. Yeah, no, they are creepy. I think they're fun, but I've never actually seen them in, in the wild. So, um, anyway, after the Ordovician, we move to the Silurian, um, which is not the Doctor Who name, um, but. This was 444 to 419 million years ago. Um, the fish diversify, we get the first arachnids, fungi start taking over the land and centipedes start getting onto land. 
Um, the fungi that does get on land is like, some of it gets really big. You get like these like tree-sized fungi. It's really crazy looking. Um, and in this picture, you can see that the trial, a lot of these trilobites are still here. They're doing fine. Um, we got a sea scorpion, Eurypterid over here. So it's a lot of the stuff that uh, was around before is still doing okay. We're all just, just living in the water. Um, and um, after that, we get the Devonian. And the Devonian is born in 19, 43, 59 million years ago. Um, the fish diversify even more, <clears throat> and we get uh, the first tetrapods, which there's a whole video about tetrapods on eons, but tetrapods are really important because that's where we come from. All of us are tetrapods. Um, tetrapod means, does anybody know what tetrapod might mean? This presentation is not sponsored by eons, it's just really great. Sonia says four legs, Rick says four limbs, that is correct. So you get the first animals that crawl in the land with four legs and, you know, basically all the terrestrial, you know, vertebrates from today are tetrapods. So even a snake is considered a tetrapod because it had those four legs and then lost them, but it came from that thing. Whales and dolphins are considered tetrapods, ichthyosaurs, plesiosaurs, penguins, even things that went back in the ocean are still considered tetrapods. Um, maybe it has multiple sponsors. Maybe it's Fit Aid and Eons, guys. I don't know. Um, Fit Aid! <laughs> anyway, um, the plants really start getting a hold of land. They start getting root, sy root systems. We get our first horsetails. We get ferns. We get the first trees. Um, also, by the way, in this picture, you can see this guy kind of back here is a tetrapod. He's like, kind of like swimming up to the, you know, his guy's legs and he's like, I might go on land today. I don't know. Um, Jeannie's, okay, hang on. I'm going to start drinking. Um, and uh, this ends with the second mass extinction on Earth. Um, and it was not great for Eurypterids. They didn't die out, but like they used to be doing really great. And now there's not so many of them anymore after this. Um, and <laughs> there was a mass extinction. Um, there are five major mass extinctions on the planet. So I guess that's only five drinks, but you could do a shot, maybe. Um, anyway, <clears throat> uh, after that, we have the Carboniferous. And that's 359, 299. Um, you get large, hot, swampy forests everywhere. Um, it's called the Carboniferous because that's where a lot of carbon comes from that we still use today. Um, these big coal forests, they called them. And because the oxygen was so high, the trees get really big, but then they also kept burning up a lot. You get these big forest fires, but then they'd regrow. It was crazy. Um, and you get the first amniotes. Does anybody know what an amniote is? Colin says, define carbon forest. It's just a forest, it's called carbon because they were just big trees with lots of big trunks and then they would burn and that would create big layers of carbon. That's what it comes from. Um, but nobody knows what an amniote is apparently. An amniote is an animal that lays a hard egg or a, a shelled egg. So you've got animals that could actually go on the land, lay their eggs and the eggs would be okay and they could hatch on land. Um, Garrett asks, wasn't this before bacteria had evolved to break down cellulose? And I think you're right, Garrett. Actually, that is also why there was so much just carbon lying around. Um, I got a cat, a saber tooth cat here who wants attention. Was that Gladys? Does she is need water? Zoe. Is Zoe. Oh, it's Zoe. Do you want me yeah. to take do you want me to take him? What? Do you want me it's to okay. take him? It's okay. Okay. Come here, Zoe. Um, what constitutes a hard shell? Good question, Steph. So a frog, even today, right, or a salamander, lays its eggs in the water because the eggs cannot survive outside the water. They'll dry out and die. So a hard shell can be laid outside the water and it will be okay. Doesn't necessarily mean it's hard like a chicken egg, like it could be like a snake egg, which are kind of soft and leathery, but it's able to survive outside of um, the water and be on land somewhere. Also, you get the first synapsids, and this guy right here is a synapsid. Um, synapsids are a type of reptile that we come from. Synapsids are the reptiles that give rise to mammals. Um, they don't all have spiny backs, but this one does. Some of them did. Um, they probably use that for thermoregulation to warm themselves up, but we don't know for sure. 
Um, Allison asks, do they make good omelets? <laughs> maybe. Um, I don't know, I've never had a snake omelet today, so I feel like maybe they didn't, but I don't know. Um, after that, we get the Permian, um, which is this period, uh, 299, 252. Um, this is where Pangaea finally forms. Um, and so uh, what happens when Pangaea forms is it causes, when you get a big supercontinent, it causes the inland areas not to get as much moisture because the way you know, clouds move and stuff. And so you get these big deserts. So suddenly there's only rainforests along the sides of things and you need animals that can really be able to survive in these drier areas. So you start, that's why it was so good to be an amniote. It's why it's good to lay your eggs out of land is now you can walk around and survive. Um, so you get these big dry island deserts, just said that. Um, and you get the synapsids. This is a synapsid. This is a gorgonopsid. Um, and this is also a synapsid here. Um, but you also get the first diapsids. And most reptiles today, in fact, I think all reptiles today really are considered diapsids. They're the other kind of big group of reptiles. Um, and um, I'm just looking at the chat really quick. Um, is it climbing out of the carcass? No, I think it's eating the carcass. Um, and one thing about these diapsids I want to point out, and we'll come back to it later, but they kind of have, these are called gorgonopsorids. These are some uh, diapsids that are like, they also have a little bit of hair, which means, you know, they would become mammals eventually. These ones have these big canine teeth, these big kind of saber teeth. And we'll talk about that towards the end. Um, also, you get conifers, the first big conifers show up, and that's it. Oh, wait, and that's it for the Permian. Um, so then, after the Permian, we have this thing called the Great Dying, and it was the worst extinction the world has ever had. It was the worst one. Like, everything died. 96% um, of all marine species and 70%... Drink, Jen. What? Yes, so drink to the Great Dying. And... Um, 96% of all marine species go extinct, 70% of all terrestrial species go extinct, which is a, a lot of stuff. Um, <laughs> so Steph says that, that means it's not the best extinction because it did the best job of killing everything. <laughs> um, uh, Garrett says the Great Dying was the saddest part of Land Before Time. Do we see the Land Before Time? I don't remember seeing it. I think it's kind of, that takes place afterwards. Anyway, I don't remember, it's been a while. Um, it was caused by, we don't actually know, extraterrestrial impact, possibly a bunch of methane getting released from the seafloor. Also, Pangaea is starting to break, um, break up. And when, when big continents break up, they start getting lots of volcanoes. So that could have been a part of it too. It was probably a combination of everything. Um, there was also an Eons video about the Great Dying, if you're curious. Um, and then we get, the, <laughs> the Mesozoic uh, comes after this, which is obviously the best one. Um, so Mesozoic is divided into three things that you should all know or learn if you learn one thing tonight, which is the Triassic, the Jurassic, and the Cretaceous are the three periods of the Mesozoic. And we're gonna talk through all of them. Um, if you want, now would be a great time if you have a chance to go grab a sheet of paper uh, blank piece of paper and have it ready if you want because you'll be able to do a little activity as we go that will help you learn things. It's not a quiz later but this will help you really like learn something. Um, things. Uh, Mesozoic means middle life. Mesozoic. Um, also California was underwater through a lot of the Mesozoic so it doesn't mean we don't find fossils in California we just tend to find lots of mosasaurs and ichthyosaurs and shells and things. Um, and also there's a whole eons about the Mesozoic, if you wanna learn about what the kind of what I'm just flying through here. Um, so if you want, you could draw this on a piece of paper. Um, put the Mesozoic at the top. Um, you can put little, at the very edge, cause we're not gonna talk about much, you could put the Permian, have the Triassic, have the Jurassic, have the Cretaceous and kind of do a little chart like this. Um, because we're gonna kind of draw, if you want, the dinosaur family tree and other things that kind of like grew and lived through this as we go, if you want. 
Um, I think every Eon's plug should be a drink too. Yeah, sure, that's a good idea. So I'm gonna wait like a minute in case people wanna like draw their charts. <clears throat> Misha says, thank you. She's ready. You ready? Misha's ready. Is anybody else still, send me a link if you're still, um, you're still going. Hey, Elisa says, wait. Okay, I'm waiting for Elisa. I, I, I saw the final slide of this and it's pretty, it's this, pretty. This uh, is the part, by the way, that took awesome. me the longest to put together. This took a lot of work, this thing as it grows, so. And he did, did you finish this while you were still drunk last night? I, I finished all but four slides. I almost finished it last night. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, I wasn't drunk. What are you talking about? Dan, are you drunk uh -huh. now? I'm not drunk now. I'm trying to he get will, it. He I'll will talk. be by the time he finishes that. I put a lot of tequila in our margarita. I, uh, I'm trying to stay sharp, guys. I, I got a lot of knowledge to lay on you. <clears throat> oh, Misha sent me the drunk um, dino history better. Yeah. Um, that's true. This is. This should be like drunk prehistory. Um, also, what time? How am I doing on time? I'm just curious. Oh, this is gonna. It's okay. We're doing okay. <clears throat> um, Elisa, how's it going there? You got my whole night, bro. You go as I long do. as you want. I know that Sarah Tarkov is on the East Coast, but you know, Sarah, Damn. you're on the Damn. East Coast. History, right? history waits for no man. That's true. That's true. It's only like 10:30. I'm fine. But Sarah Tarkov is no man. That's true. Thank you. Thank really you. good point. <laughs> yes. yes, yes, yes. Is, is Blade here? Blade had all these fun questions. I don't know if I actually he's actually here. Blade's I'm here, man. You're here. I'm here. Blade's here. Oh, Blade is here. Great. Did you? Yeah. Have you yeah. been here since the beginning? I'm sorry. Did you Did you get here at the beginning? I missed the first 15 minutes. You is missed, that when all the questions were answered? Missed, no, no. Your questions are coming, but you missed your weird little Obapinia guy. Yeah. Is this so, recorded? It it is. Oh great! I can go. I can go back later and watch it again. Yes. Yes. Perfect. Uh, Elise is good. We're gonna keep moving. Great. Um, oh shit! Oh. So I wanted to very quickly. I keep saying the word reptile, and this is just a very quick aside. We're gonna basically draw a version of this eventually, um, but. Uh, today, we kind of use the word reptile. It's very easy to say, oh, that scaly thing that lays eggs and is cold-blooded and crawls around is a reptile. But, like, it's, and has hard eggs, so stuff, yes, correct. Um, but it's actually, like, a very, like, easy term today. But, um, uh, it's like, I'm trying to think how to say this, but basically, if you look at this family tree and you see how things are connected, like, Crocodiles and birds are actually more closely related to each other than crocodiles are to like lizards and snakes, squamates down here. Um, mammals are amniotes. Yes, we no longer lay hard eggs, but we came from synapses, which did. Um, amphibians, Brian says, we're amphibians. Amphibians are not amniotes. Amphibians are like off somewhere else, a different part of the tree. So amphibians Misha are, said that. Misha, oh, said, Misha that. said that. Yeah, yeah. Um, and um, so yeah, it's just, just like kind of a thing to think about is like, we can still say reptile, it still works, but it is like not actually how they're related to each other. Like a croc and a bird are actually pretty close because they're both archosaurs, which we're getting into. And like turtles are these weird question marks. That's why it's a dotted line. Like we actually don't know where turtles really started. It's this whole um, thing. So um, anyway, let's move into the Triassic, the first period of the dinosaurs. Um, and, oh, Trisha, I didn't see Trisha here. And she was the one who wanted to learn about turtles. Oh, well. Um, so this is what the world looked like during the Triassic. So you can see it's kind of Pangaea, but it's kind of starting to break apart. Um, there we go. Um, and so an overview of the Triassic. Um, so right before this was the Great Dying, like, Everything died, right? So the first part of the Triassic's kind of crazy because like there's just not a lot of life out there. And there's kind of like the animals that make it just kind of like if you took a little time machine to the Triassic, you'd like be like, hey, there's that animal. And there it is again. And there's maybe like one other one, but it's kind of just not a lot of diverse biodiversity. It's all like the same stuff. It's just real boring because there's just not much that made it through. 
Um, but you do get conifers, such as the Stramac Cherolipidaceae. You wanted me to talk about that, which is just a type of conifer, as far as I can tell. Matt, if you have something more interesting to say about that, please speak up. Um, uh, yes. Um, it's got the first cycadophytes, or like more cycadophytes, cycads. Um, you start getting the first early seed plants, uh, plants that lay, lay seeds. Um, Ryan says, my friend Jake really wants to join, can he come? I say, absolutely, just send him the info. Uh, um, and you get, um, Jen, would you like to say anything about plants right now? I'm, I'd be free, to, I think everybody would love to hear it. Jen, Jen. Yeah. That was, the, I just, I feel like, you know, the plants in the street, I'm just not getting a lot of, a lot of respect right now, Dan. Like, uh, I, I, don't know. I am not a, I'm not, I'm not a paleontologist for one thing, and I'm certainly not a paleobotanist. Wow. So well, maybe you should become one. I mean, <laughs> in the next five minutes. <laughs> right now. We are going to talk about, plants are going to get talked about. I just don't have a lot to say about uh, uh, You're going to say more bad things about them, I take No, I've said some great <laughs> things. I talked about how plants caused the first mass extinction. Weren't you listening? Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> and on that note. Um, anyway, um, so you also get archosaurs, which are a type of diapsid. We talked about that. Um, they are a very diverse and interesting group that include crocs, dinosaurs, and others. And the things that really helped archosaurs out is that they had air sacs in their body, in their like bones and bodies and whatever that help them just be more active and lightweight and able to move around. Um, so um, there's also an eons that talks specifically about archosaurs, if you're curious about that. But um, that's, it's a really successful, great group. And right now it's kind of trying, it starts radiating out and trying new things. Um, oh my God, this is gonna be so many drinks because there's a bunch of eons alerts in this one. Um, you also get the first ichthyosaurs, uh, which are these reptiles that go back into the water and become like dolphins, basically, but they're reptiles. Um, and um, and then you get the <laughs> uh, and then you also get the first plesiosaurs, like the Loch Ness monster, basically, uh, start showing up in the Triassic. They are also not dinosaurs; they are a type of diapsid, um, but they are also start giving rise in this time. And um, you get the first pterosaurs. There's a whole eons about pterosaurs. Pterosaurs are totally awesome. They are a type of archosaur, but they are not a type of dinosaur. And we will talk into um, about pterosaurs as well. Yeah, um, and you get the first testudines, which are turtles. And again, we kind of don't know early turtle evolution. There's an eons that kind of goes into a little bit, uh, but um, anyway, uh, turtles are kind of cool and really interesting, and they show up in the Triassic too, the first ones. Um, so I feel like I just want to have a moment here where the Triassic is kind of this, a lot of people don't talk about the Triassic much because they get all excited about the Jurassic because the Jurassic Park and the Cretaceous because that's where all the crazy cool dinosaurs are. And actually like Jurassic is kind of awesome. It's like this time where like for a while there's like nothing. And um, then all of life starts trying things out and starts rating out. And we start just seeing it all, so what's left just starts kind of trying to figure out what to do. And dinosaurs show up, but like even dinosaurs are like not the dominant thing. They're like one of the things among all these other things that are just trying to get a foothold and figure things out. And it's just this really neat time that I think people don't appreciate enough. So um, Colin says, um, what is, was an example of an archosaur that we would know? Colin, an archosaur, well, we'll go into that, but crocodiles are archosaurs. Um, pterosaurs, pterodactyls are archosaurs. Um, Dinosaurs are archosaurs, but, pterodact but pterodactyls and crocs are not um, dinosaurs. And this will kind of make sense as we start drawing the chart. Um, so this was Jackson's pick. Uh, this is Longisquama. And um, it lived 235 million years ago. It's an early archosaur. So it is not a You've dinosaur. Got back for days. Yeah, back but it's got these crazy little spikes. Days. I uh, love him. And Amanda says, pterodactyls are not dinosaurs. No, Amanda, they're archosaurs. They are not dinosaurs. Um, but yes, so this is Longisquama. It's, I feel lied to. It's, yeah, we're going to learn all about it. Don't worry. 
Um, it could probably glide and parachute down from the trees and stuff on these crazy little leg -like thingies it had. Um, and um, that's actually all I got for Longus Guama, sorry. But it's really cute, really cool. It's not very big, but it's this fun little crazy looking thing that was just hopping around the trees. Um, and then, uh-oh, oh no, did I, my computer just freeze? What happened? Uh-oh, oh no. Uh-oh. Oh man, this is bad. Oh wait, now we're back, maybe. Um, I'm gonna stop the share really quick. No, I don't wanna annotate. I think we can still hear you, Dan. You can hear me, but I can't see my cursor. And I can't, it's not. Um, doing anything. Wait, mouse. It's not like reacting. Oh no! We didn't even get to the dinosaurs. <laughs> <laughs> um, now you can't say. Okay. It's not your computer because Zoom is working. Can you restart PowerPoint? That's what I'm trying yeah. to do. Yeah, maybe that's what I gotta do. Give me a minute. It can't. It's PowerPoint is not letting me restart. I'm gonna force. I'm gonna force put PowerPoint and still back in. We're just taking a longest intermission. Yes. Okay. It's Hi, everybody. We're back. Screen sharing has stopped. No worries, Thanks, Dan. PowerPoint. It's, it is what it is. Everything's it is fine. It. Oh man. It would not be a presentation if it didn't go wrong. That's true. A presentation That's true. over Zoom is very authentic. Um. Nope. Oh, there's all my Zoom shares. Oh, maybe that's what's holding it up. Um, uh, Dino Zoom. Birthday Zoom. Okay. And now you guys are gonna know how long this damn presentation is. Um, here we go. Long Squama. We're back. I love you, Dan. No, it's okay. Gonna keep going. Boom, 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 Long Squama. Next we have Sino. Wait, can you guys see me? Am I not? Screen again. I gotta show the screen. You're right. That's okay. Oh man, sweating. Great. Can you guys see this? Yeah. And the chat. I'm just opening the chat so I can see it. We can see it. Okay, we're good. Great. So on to Sinomathis. Um, before I click anything here, what do you guys think? Do you think this is a diapsid or a synapsid? Based on what it's what it looks like. Synapsid. Which Did one? I? Synapsid. A lot of people say synapsid. That's correct, because it looks like a mammal. Um, it is a mammal relative, and it's about four feet long. It's actually eating another synapsid, I think. But um, it's a predator, which is pretty clear by the picture. Um, and it chewed before swallowing, which I know sounds kind of crazy, but it was like, that was a thing a lot of things couldn't do before this. So it was able to like chew its food. Um, so polite. Uh, next we have Ichthyosaurus, which shows up right at the end of the Triassic into the Jurassic. But um, this is one of those um, lizards that, or not lizards, this is reptiles that went back into the ocean. Um, and it was discovered by Mary Anning in 1811. That's kind of doesn't mean anything to anyone, but that's, it was one of the first like fossils that we like found and figured out what it was. It was actually like discovered before dinosaurs, but it was kind of this big deal. They're like, what's this? And, um, I love this boy. He's a good boy. Yeah, yeah. This is Dylan's pick, yeah. Um, it is, so it, this is a uh, diapsid, but it is not a archosaur. Um, it gave live birth. We know that it gave live birth. We found fossils with live birth, um, without her giving live birth. Um, it breathed air because it's a reptile, so it wasn't like a fish. It was actually like a dolphin. It had to go breathe air and come back down. Um, uh, it had very large eyes. Um, so not this one, but it had some, some types of ichthyosaurs had the largest eyes of any animal ever, aside from the giant squid. How so, big are those eyes? Like big old dinner plates. Like, like that, like like twelve inches, twenty-four. Stop it! Uh, I don't know how big. Big. 
Like, I'm gonna go get a big dinner and it's a big old plate, like that big. I'd have to look that up. Um, yeah, this one did not have the, this, sorry, Alex and Jack, this one did not have eyes that big. <laughs> That's a species that did have eyes that big. And they think maybe it was a deep diver so we could see better, you know, that sort of thing. Um, but yeah, some of them, some ichthyosaurs had huge eyes. This one did not, this is kind of one of the earlier ones. It's kind of your, your basic ichthyosaur. I mean, there are earlier ones than this, but whatever. And then, moving on, we get the first dinosaurs. Uh, this is Eoraptor. Uh, it's one of the first dinosaurs, if not, and it's hard to say where you draw the line, but it's the early dinosaur. Um, and I thought we'd take a moment here to ask, what is a dinosaur? Um, so what's interesting about this picture before you even get started is this little guy in the middle is a dinosaur. Um, but these are actually um, crocodilian relatives, um, which would mean they're archosaurs. This is an etosaur and this is a phytosaur, um, but they are not dinosaurs. Um, and um, phytosaur is spelled P-H-Y-T-O-S-A-U-R. Um, Aetosaurs are spelled A-E-T-O-S-A-U-R, I think. Anyway, don't worry about it. That's not that important. Um, and dinosaur means terrible lizard. That's what it, that's dino means terrible in Greek. Saur means reptile or lizard. Dinosaurs are really diverse, active animals. They, they're very successful. They live for a long time. They're lots of different things as we'll get into. Um, they mostly lived on land. So if you see a plesiosaur, an ichthyosaur, a mosasaur, that is not a dinosaur. Dinosaurs were land dwellers, except for some things we'll get into like Spinosaurus that was like, I'm gonna live in the river now. Um, but um, yeah, uh, dinosaurs kept their legs straight below their body. So a lot of these crocodiles and stuff kind of have their legs out like this, whereas dinosaurs keep their legs right below, um, which kind of helps them be very active and move around. Um, you all know this, but certain dinosaurs gave rise to birds. Uh, dinosaurs tended to live, they grew up very fast and they died young. They did not like grow slowly like a reptile. They just grew up real quick and then they didn't live very long. They would live like, it depends on the dinosaur, but a lot of them wouldn't make it past 30. Um, so if I was a dinosaur, I'd be dead. Um, and they rose in the Triassic, but as I kind of said before, the Jurassic is where they really started to diversify and kind of get a big foothold. Um, they lived for 175 million years, so that's a long period of time. Our species has only lived for 200,000 years, and our genus, Homo, has only been around for 2 million years. So dinosaurs were around way longer than we had. We were just a little sliver. Um, and they weren't all big. Some of them, we all kind of think of dinosaurs as big things, but some of them were very small. I mean, birds are very small, but some of them other, like your average dinosaur is probably about the size of a big cow, and a lot of them were smaller than that. So they were all different sizes. Um, so now, I know this is getting complicated here, but um, so we're going to talk about the two types of dinosaurs, Saurischia and Ornithischia. So dinosaurs kind of break off into two groups. Saurischias means lizard hit, and ornithischia means bird hit. Now, the crazy part is that saurischia actually, even though it means lizard hit, that's the part that actually gives rise to birds. It's very complicated and annoying that that's the way it works, but that's the way it works. Ornithischians kind of give rise to all the stuff at the bottom here. All the stuff, I can't point my screen, that doesn't help. These are ornithischians, these are saurischians. Um, so, um, Allison asked, what are we? We are synapsids, Allison. We're mammals, but we are, come from synapsids, which are amniotes. Uh, I don't know if that answered your question, but, um, are we human? Asked Cherish, or are we dancer? Keep drinking, we'll find out. Um, <laughs> Gwen asked, what kind of hips are we? We are not dinosaurs, so we're not either of these. You can choose whichever one you want. We're hipsters, says Sonia. Okay. Um, anyway, the one crazy thing is th what I just told you is like the thing you'll read in like every dinosaur book. And like two years ago, these guys showed up and wrote this paper where they like threw all of this into question. And so, you know, at the end of the day, it's just like, hey, this is all being debated. We don't know. Um, but 
I'm gonna stick with this for now. It's always good to question things and figure things out. Um, I'm not buying their new thing about Ornithoscolita yet. Um, and there are YouTube links. They are not Eon's links, but there are YouTube links I will have after the talk that will kind of go through some of that. If you're really curious, it gets really technical. But if you want, you can check it out. <clears throat> um, at the end of Triassic, there is another big extinction. Um, it was possibly because of Pangaea breaking up and volcanoes kind of arising and things like that. Um, uh, but it also, this is what allowed the dinosaurs to kind of radiate out and change. Um, so, you know, it was a bummer, but hey, it let us have really cool dinosaurs. So, if you want to put any of this on your sheet, now is the time. Um, we talked about the diapsids and the synapsids. Um, so here we have, the synapsids keep going through the Triassic here. Um, I've also tried to put some plants in that kind of represent the plants that were around at the time. Um, up here we have the diapsids and um, one branch of the diapsids leads to the archosaurs. Um, uh, and the archosaurs, one branch up here is the crocs, which kind of show up the earliest. And they really do lots of different things. They're not just the crocs we have today. There are lots of different kinds of crocs. Um, Jody asks, will there be a version of this sheet with illustrations after? It's, I'm going to send a PDF of this whole thing, so you'll have this at the end if you want. Um, and um, <laughs> else, what was the question? I'm saying, yeah, that would be easier because you have all the cool photos in here. Yeah, I mean, try to draw them. You guys don't have to draw if you don't want to. I just think you, you kind yes, of have to draw Dan made this chart. And Allison. Allison, yes, I made this chart. I just, this is what yeah, kept me going really. the last few days. Um, so crocs, you know, we know crocs did fine all the way through. Um, we get the first pterosaurs in Triassic. We talk about that they are archosaurs and they go, and we know they're going to keep going, but we're going to kind of talk about what happens to them later. But they do at least go into the Jurassic. Um, we get Longusquama's little archosaur. He's an early archosaur here, so it's just chilling out over here. Um, we get dinosaurs here, and we talked about how we'd have the lizard hipped and the bird hipped. We're gonna talk about how they change the next chunk of time, but those are all kind of the archosaurs right back here. Um, another diapsid is the plesiosaurs, like the Loch Ness Monster, and we're gonna talk about what happens to them later. Um, we have the ichthyosaurs that come down here. Um, the only reason I'm putting them there is just to make room. It's not like they belong in any specific spot, but they're also diapsids. Um, and then we have, you know, we have turtles. I put a dotted line because again, we're not entirely sure about where turtles come from, but there's turtles there. Um, Anastasia asks, is Archaeopteryx an archosaur? Yes, it is. Archaeopteryx is also a dinosaur, um, but dinosaurs are a type of archosaur. So think of it as like Russian nesting dolls, I guess. Um, uh, so, um, Alex and Jack, uh, Alex and Jack, oh, I'm drinking now, uh, 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 say, we know all this, but what are turtles? Yeah, watch the Eons video when we're done. Um, anyway, I think we can move on. Any other, I'm trying to see if there are any other questions. Um, next, we'll move into the Jurassic. Um, I really like this picture. It's a really cool picture. Um, we get big old sauropods. We get little stegosaurs here. We get some early ankylosaurs. We get some like pterosaurs over here. Um, we get uh, like some early ornithopods. We'll talk about all these things. We get these big towering trees. There's actually a couple little birdie Archaeopteryx things in the branches here if you look really closely. So this is like a good example of what's going on in the Jurassic. Um, also, they gave these guys feathers, which we don't know, but. Um, it's a nice idea, especially since we know that they're on the side that gives rise to birds, even if birds didn't directly come from these. So, um, yeah, it's a cool picture. Um, here's what the world looked like during the Jurassic. It's starting to break apart. Um, basically, we get these two supercontinents. Um, this is Laurasia up at top, and this bottom part is called Gondwana land. Um, so the top part is Asia and North America. The bottom part is kind of Africa and South America and Australia all kind of stuck together. Um, and Sarah asks, are we still underwater? Mostly, yes. Uh, California's most, because here's, actually, that's a very good question. Um, is throughout the Mesozoic, the world was a lot warmer than it is today, generally. So, 
as we know today, what happens when things get warmer? Sea levels tend to go up. So a lot of stuff is underwater. Also, continents are still being pushed up anyway, but like a lot of things wind up being underwater because it's warmer weather. Um, so we're going to quickly talk about, I kind of already said a lot of this, but we're going to talk about kind of what the Jurassic's all about. Um, dinos diversify, I kind of said that already. Um, conifers dominate, we get huge forests everywhere, big tall trees. It's kind of like Northern California or the, and the Oregon coast. That's kind of just what it looks like a lot of the place. Um, and we get the first true squamates, which are basically lizards, but true lizards don't really show up until now. We have a lot of lizard-like things earlier, but this is like the first actual lizards. Um, and we get the first true mammals. I put a question mark because there's sort of a question about where you actually say, oh, that's a mammal. But by now, we're starting to get things that are like, yeah, that's a mammal. It looks like a rat. It's basically a rat. Like, that definitely starts happening in the Jurassic. Um, we'll talk about some kind of things you guys picked. Uh, I kind of um, mentioned that <laughs> Max funny calls down. Mention plesiosaurs. So here is a plesiosaur. Um, this is a plesiosaurus. It is a type of plesiosaur. Um, this is kind of your classic plesiosaur. It, it's, um, it gave life birth as well. Um, it breathed air, just like it is a reptile. Um, it has teeth and jaws that are good for trapping fish and squid. It kind of had these jaws that are meant to clamp in and trap things. Um, and uh, it is, this is plesiosaurus is kind of just your very typical long neck plesiosaur. Um, and also it's not a dinosaur. It is a diapsid, but not a dinosaur. If you look at your chart again, um, you also get Leopleurodon, which I believe is Emily's pick. Um, it is eating some poor plesiosaurus. So uh, Leopleurodon at this time, um, it was very big, 20 feet long. Um, Sarah asks, how big is this thing? It's 20 feet long, it says right there. Um, it is a pliosaur. And so pliosaurs are a group of plesiosaurs that branched off. So they are a type of plesiosaur, but they kind of did a different attack plan. They kind of wound up having short necks and these big crushing jaws. Um, and I mean, there's something I could tell. I, some plesiosaurs, this gets complicated, maybe I shouldn't tell you this, but some plesiosaurs actually do become short-necked plesiosaurs, but they're not considered pliosaurs because pliosaurs is specifically an offshoot group. Don't worry about that too much, just think pliosaurs are this branch of short-necked plesiosaurs. Um, and um, this was an ambush predator, apex predator, king of its sea, whatever. Um, however, some ple pliosaurs in the Cretaceous get even bigger. They get to be like twice this big. Um, I've seen their fossils. Uh, they are huge. They take up an entire wall. They are just gigantic and terrifying and awesome. So um, Leoplorodon's a really big, big thing, but they're ones that got even bigger. Um, Steph says Lapras, kind of. Um, and also we're going to talk about pterosaurs a little bit. Um, so this is a Ramphorhynchus. Um, and this thing wasn't that big. Um, it is uh, a good example of what's called a rampharynchoid. So the first pterosaurs were long, had often were called rampharynchoids, and they do continue on, but they tended to have long tails and shorter faces. Um, and they um, actual what they would call pterodactyloids tend to have longer bills and shorter tails. Um, so they actually are two different types of pterosaurs. So when you say pterodactyl, you wouldn't technically be talking about this, you would be talking about um, like a, a, a different kind of thing. Um, but I wanted to show you what a rampharynchoid was to kind of show you the two different groups. Um, this one specifically, they think was nocturnal. They can tell by looking at its eye bones and things. Um, and they think it ate like a nocturnal fish hunter as they just think what it was. Um, that's kind of a rampharynchus. Now we're going to talk about, so, so by the way, everything we just talked about, that little batch, none of those were dinosaurs. Those were all pterosaurs or archosaurs. The other things are diapsids, but they were not dinosaurs. Now we're going to talk about some dinosaurs, finally. Um, we're going to talk about the sauropods, which are awesome. Um, they're long necks. We all know what sauropods are. Um, 
a question is asked, why were they so big? Um, they were the biggest things to ever walk on our planet. They were just freaking gigantic. Um, gotta take a drink. All right. Um, and they, the thing is, so honestly, sauropods confuse the hell out of paleontology. They don't really know how these things actually made it. They're just so crazy. Um, but one guess is they did have pretty light bones for their size. They were like hollow ish bones to kind of make themselves be light. Um, also, there was just, as I said, these giant forests everywhere. So if you have giant forests, you gotta have something to eat them. So it was very useful to be very big and tall and be able to grab all this stuff up tall on these trees. And uh, also, another thing is like an elephant today, once you get to be a certain size, like nothing messes with you. You're just so damn big. So that's some of the reasons why they might have gotten so big. But yeah, nothing got as big as these guys. Um, we're going to talk about a sauropod example, which is Brontosaurus or Apatosaurus. Um, Live at the end of the late Jurassic. <clears throat> I don't know if I should go on too much about this, but throughout my lifetime, um, there's a lot of debate, talk about, you used to say that Brontosaurus wasn't a thing, it used to look different, blah, blah, blah. I'll, the very quick version is, oh wait, Lauren wants to know about this. Okay, so I'll talk about this. So, if you look at old books from like the 50s, they all say Brontosaurus. And um, also it has a big fat flat skull. And so the rule with science is you're supposed to name the thing after the, the first name it's given. So they had found stuff that they called a Patasaurus, but then they found a more complete skeleton of something that they had called Brontosaurus, and that got really popular in, with kids' books and stuff. But they didn't have a skull for it. They didn't know what its head looked like for a long time. Um, as they started finding more and more skeletons, they, they realized, oh, all this stuff we've been calling Brontosaurus, it's all the same thing as a Patasaurus, so we should just call it a Patasaurus. And so if you talk to little Dan in third grade and somebody says, oh, my favorite's Brontosaurus, I would like, nah, -uh, it's Patasaurus. There's no such thing as a Brontosaurus. Uh -uh. Um, and we did find its skull and we realized it had a long, thin skull. They used to give it a skull that looked like Camarasaurus, which is another kind of sauropod. Um, and then they realized, oh, it's got this long, thin skull. Um, however, scientists are always changing their mind about names of things. And lately, in like five years ago, they kind of looked at all the bones again and went, you know what? Actually, maybe these are two different things. They're really similar, but they might be actually two different things. So Brontosaurus is cool again. And so now there is a Brontosaurus and a Patasaurus. So that's that thing. Um, so yeah, you can, both of them are things as of right now. Uh, Jody asks, how does Brachiosaurus fit into here? Uh, it is another type of sauropod that lived around the same time. Um, there's just lots of different sauropods at the end of late Jurassic. Um, and uh, Brachiosaurus was got the big arms and was built to reach up. Um, even Brachiosaurus actually has a lot of the same issues where there's now something called Giraffa Titan, which looks almost exactly like Brachiosaurus, but scientists are like, nah, they're different. So there's a Brachiosaurus, a Giraffa Titan, there's a Patasaurus, there's a Diplodocus, there's a Brontosaurus, there's a Camarasaurus. There's all these different sauropods. They all look kind of different, but all look kind of the same. Um, anyway, uh, these guys grew ridiculously fast. So like a newly born one of these things would have been like the size of a small puppy and it was full grown in 15 years. So it's just crazy how quickly they grew. Um, a lot of them probably got eaten real quick though because they laid a lot of eggs uh, at once. Um, so this particular one was 72 feet long. Some dinosaurs got way, or some sauropods got way bigger than that, but this is a pretty good sized one. Um, some speculate that maybe it reared off on its back legs to feed in the trees. Uh, some scientists think that was what they did. Some scientists think that isn't what they did. Um, I think they probably did because all the trees were so big, it just made sense that that's what you'd want to do. Um, and they had whip-like tails to defend themselves. So they would, if something came after them, if you were stupid enough to come after one of these things, they would have like a bullwhip tail that they could whip you with. Um, Gwen asks, how long did normal dinos take to grow up? Um, so 15 years is pretty fast, but some did it even faster. Um, some took a little longer, but that's about average. They grew real quick. 
Um, now we're going to talk about theropods. Um, so theropods are this really cool, awesome, great group. I imagine a lot of your favorite dinosaurs are members of the theropods. Um, and we'll talk about a lot of them. Um, this is Alex's pick, I believe, Kai Hong, um, which is from China. It is in the middle Jurassic. It is a Paravian, which means it's closely related to birds. Um, and um, it means rainbow in Chinese. It's about the size of a duck. And we actually know it was this color. Um, what's crazy is that you used to like look at kids' books and they would say, we don't know what color dinosaurs were, we'll never know. And now we can actually figure that out because we can find fossilized things called melanosomes. And by looking at melanosomes of animals alive today and comparing them, we can sort of guesstimate what colors they were. There's an Eon's video about it, as I'm sure you've all noticed. Um, and um, so we know this guy was, I mean, like, it's not perfect. Like sometimes you have to guess a little bit. We get a pretty good idea what a lot of these things colors were, especially if they had feathers. But even if they didn't have feathers, we can start figuring it out. It depends on what's um, been, you know, how well preserved it is. But so we know this thing was like black and then had a like rainbow head. We like, act, like iridescent. We actually know that, which is totally awesome. Um, now we're going to talk about Archaeopteryx. Um, which means ancient wing. It is considered the first bird. Um, but again, kind of like where do you draw the line? But right now they're saying Archaeopteryx is like the first bird. Um, it could probably fly, but it was probably not as advanced as birds are today. It probably kind of fluttered around a lot. Um, it's about the same size as a raven. And looking at those melanosomes that they've started to do now with all Archaeopteryx fossils, a size of a raven, so Allison asks. Um, so it's probably kind of raven colored, at least to some degree. Um, they asked, what little guy is he about to murder? Could be a baby compsognathus, maybe, because that was around the same time and place. I don't know. Um, and it lived in dry island habitats. Um, we know that the area it lived in were kind of these dry, small islands. So it probably, you know, kind of popped around these little islands and you know, that sort of thing. And there's a whole Eons video <laughs> about Archaeopteryx. If you want to learn about, and the evolution of birds, you want to learn about that. Now we're getting to the Allison Anamovic dinosaur, Allosaurus. Yeah. One's for Allie. <clears throat> um, lived at the end of the Jurassic, about 28 feet long. Um, so this one we kind of know by looking at its uh, bones and things and finding the smaller skeletons and stuff. It was full grown about 22, 28 years. Um, so a little slower than the sauropods. It was the alpha predator of its time. Um, we know it fought Stegosaurus because we found like wounds on Allosaurus that like match Stegosaurus spikes and stuff. Um, and we've also found like Stegosaurus with bite marks on them and stuff. Like they've, they, they know they totally were at doing this stuff. Um, there's some evidence to support that maybe it was a social animal, maybe it worked in groups. Trackways show that maybe it was like moving together in like small groups and things. Um, and it had a very good sense of smell, we can tell by looking at its uh, skull structure. And it probably attacked by like kind of grabbing and gripping and tearing things apart. That's kind of how it, how it ate as opposed to other ways. It didn't actually have a very strong bite. It had a strong bite, but not like the strongest. Um, but it's pretty awesome. Alistair is pretty rad. Um, now we're going to talk about uh, the Thyrior Forans, um, which are armored dinosaurs. Um, they're a different group. They're um, on the bird hip side of things. And um, how, what are you doing on time? How long is this going? We're good. Oh my God, we're already an hour in. We're gonna keep going. Um, one of those is Stegosaurus. Yes, Stegosaurus. Is and Amanda's my boy. A, lot of, a lot of people pick Stegosaurus. Steg. Um, yes, no way up and through. I'm gonna keep going, guys. Um, it had these spikes in its tail, as I'm sure you know, called thagomizers that it used for defense. Um, the plates on its back, they don't, they kind of keep, not really sure what they were used for. Um, mainly probably for display. We know that they had blood vessels that actually ran into them. So it could, um, Jen says solar power. I actually don't think so. I disagree with the solar panel thing. Um, 
personally, I think that that doesn't make sense for, um, I did not include the far side comic, David, but uh, I just, there are other types of stegosaurs where the plates just don't really make sense in terms of how they're placed in its back. So I don't think it did that. Maybe it did, but maybe not. Um, I think that it was, we, we, it, if it got angry or wanted, it could kind of flush the plates with, with blood and kind of look a little larger, I think it was kind of used to display to other stegosaurs. Or just if a predator shows up, it would kind of make itself just look bigger and scarier. That's kind of my thoughts on it. Um, Sonia says flare, and that's basically what I would say. It also had an armored throat. It's like a bunch of scutes on its throat even. Um, so it had lots of armor. Um, had a very tiny brain, was not very smart. Um, one of the smallest brains ever in terms of its size. Um, and uh, possibly also reared up on its back legs to feed and kind of used its tail like a tripod body. And there's a whole eons about stegosaurus specifically. <laughs> All right, um, now we're gonna talk about another group, the ornithopods. Is everybody having fun, by the way, or are they getting real sick of this? I'm just curious. This is delightful. Right. Keep going, please. Okay, just wanted to check. Great. Oh okay. God, I'm on an IV drip. Yeah. Right. Yep, yep. Just want to make sure. I want to check it. I feel like I'm talking about it. Dreams are coming. Dreams are coming true. Dreams are coming a little bit faster. That's all I'm going to say. Dreams are coming true. Okay. Um, so the ornithopods is another group. Um, so we have the thyreophorans, which are the armored ones. And these are the ornithopods. It literally means bird feet. And we'd call these kind of your duck bills. It's kind of your classic term. But a lot of the early ones were small. A lot of them got bigger. They're actually they're kind of this, but they're kind of just like the deer of the Mesozoic. They're kind of just out there eating stuff. Um, they're really cool, but they're just kind of your go-to herbivore. Um, we'll talk more about them in the Cretaceous. But anyway, um, Jeannie asks, how accurate is the Lamb Before Time? That's a different conversation, but the short version is not very accurate, but it's real cute. Uh, it's got a great score by James Horner. Um, and anyway, so I'm going to talk about the Jurassic Cretaceous transition. Um, Dylan, I like it. I said I liked it. It's not very accurate. Um, so this kind of shows some dinosaurs from the Triassic, some dinosaurs from the Jurassic, and some dinosaurs from the Cretaceous. And before I say anything, um, what do you notice about dinosaurs in the Jurassic versus dinosaurs in the Cretaceous? I want to know what some people might notice about those things. They're getting smaller. They get smaller, right. Um, more compact bodies, lower to the ground, variation in size. Um, all correct. So, um, there is sort of an extinction or at least a transition from the Jurassic to Cretaceous. And it's probably due to, it's not considered a major extinction, but it's probably due to, um, you had all these giant forests in the Jurassic and then the climate changed a lot as the continents continued to break up and you started to get flowering plants. And if you have these giant sauropods decimating these forests, it takes a while for that forest, these giant forests to grow back. And um, so, but flowering plants, even the early ones, grow back much quicker. They're much better at taking over a disturbed area and kind of growing back. And so the world started to kind of get taken over by these smaller flowering plants. And so a lot of the dinosaurs that are better for eating those kind of things started to survive. The sauropods stuck around. There were still sauropods around, but they didn't, they were no longer like the thing that was just everywhere. There were less sauropods around and because these forests were not as common and there were more flowering plants. And so dinosaurs that kind of ate the flowering plants took, took over. Um, and so that's kind of one of the things at least that was going on aside from the continents breaking and climates changing and things um, also happening. Um, so by the way, <laughs> this is everything we've talked about up to now is now back on the chart. Um, we'll kind of go through it all really quickly. If you want to draw it, draw to draw it that. go ahead. Um, I mean, I didn't draw the dinosaurs. I got those from clip art and stuff. But, uh, but yeah, I drew all the other stuff. So pterosaurs, we talked about, uh, I'm just going to go through as quick as I possibly can. Um, we talked about the rampharynchoids, which evolved first, which are the ones with the longer tails and shorter beaks. 
And then in the mid-Jurassic, we get the pterodactyloids, which have the longer beaks and shorter tails. So they kind of branch off. And the rampharynchoids don't make it through the Cretaceous. They get kind of through at least half of it, and then they die. Um, the sauropods uh, show up here, the early Mesos Jurassic. There actually are things called prosauropods before that. We don't have to worry about that. Um, and they do go all the way through, but as I talked about, they are not as common in the Cretaceous. And here's a patasaurus, since some people picked that. Um, uh, Allison says these bottom ones are not evolving at all. That's not necessarily true. It just doesn't mean I showed them this. I'm just focusing on the dinosaurs. I just wanted to show some of this other stuff that's going on too. Um, the theropods, also sauropods and theropods are lizard hipped as we talked about. Theropods, um, they do tons of stuff, but um, one thing that happens at the end of the Jurassic is one branch becomes the Paravians. This is, um, oh my gosh, Kai Hong, little guy who's a Paravian. Um, and uh, one branch of that are the early birds, which is Archaeopteryx is over here. And as we know, the birds continue on and boom, they make it. Um, Paravians actually do lots of different things. Um, we'll talk some more about what that is later on, but I just said non-bird Paravians because Birds are technically paravians, which are technically theropods, which are technically saurischians, which are dinosaurs, which are archosaurs. Um, but the non-bird paravians continue on, do lots of neat things in the Cretaceous, and then they die out. Um, the other ones that are not paravians, but also still theropods, like Allosaurus, they do more things. We'll see some more of them, too. Lots of technicalities in here, Dan. I know. I'm sorry. Um, Cretaceous. Um, the thyri of four ands, which are the armored guys, they're going to split into the ankylosaurs. We're we'll talking about them next. But the stegosaurs really only make it through the Jurassic, and they don't really do much in the Cretaceous and die out pretty early. Uh, there's only a couple, and they don't lose so well. Um, and then the ornithopods, I don't have any pictured yet, but they really kind of get started here, but then they really take off in the Cretaceous. And we'll talk about the other type of uh, bird hip dinosaurs in the next chapter. Um, and then plesiosaurs, we got plesiosaurus here. Um, we got Lelopleurodon here. Um, and they're going to continue into the Cretaceous for a while, and then they don't quite make it to the end, and we'll kind of maybe find out why soon. Um, but the regular plesiosaurs, that's the non pliosaur ones, they actually make it all the way to the end. And um, we have the squamates, I'll we'll talk about them, the first lizards, boom, they get to make it all the way through. We got the synapsids becoming the mammals, they make it all the way through. And down here we got some of the plants. I tried to kind of show that these big forests were showing up. Um, throughout the Jurassic. Um, Allison asks, is my background in the Jurassic? I don't know what that means. I actually like the Cretaceous more. It gets way cooler in the Cretaceous. Just wait. Um, oh, my Zoom background. I see what you mean. I was like, I thought you meant like my like science background. I'm like, what the hell does that mean? I guess I'm drinking. Um, I think it is. This looks like the Jurassic. It's got a big sauropod. Yeah, probably. Um, and, oh good, it's not frozen. Now we're gonna talk about the Cretaceous. <laughs> um, here's some famous well-known dinosaurs in the Cretaceous. Cretaceous is a great time. Um, <laughs> I'm Irish, Allison, if you're curious. Um, and so here's the Cretaceous. As you can see, it's starting to kind of look a bit like the world today. Um, we got Australia down here by Antarctica, which, and we got Africa, we got India and Madagascar, South America, North America. Um, but you can see, especially in North America, we had this big shallow inland sea, which was very rich and diverse in life. Um, and so lots of animals lived along the Cretaceous Sea, especially along Western North America. So a quick overview about the Cretaceous. Dinosaurs diversify even more. Angiosperms take over, which are the flowering plants. I'll talk about that. And there's an Eons video about it. Um, some examples of some of the plants that take over that are considered flowering plants are magnolias, laurels, sycamores, oaks, and palms. Um, and we also get the first snakes. Um, also, snakes evolved to eat mammals. They were like our, like they hunted our ancestors. Um, and um, sauropods do decline, especially in North America. They, they, and around the world, they don't, 
They're still around, but they are not everywhere. Um, but the ones that stick around, especially in South America, get real weird. Um, they get real cool. Some of them get armor, some get big crazy spikes, and some of them get, actually I should, well, I, we can talk. Some of them become the biggest dinosaurs we've ever had. So even though it's Cretaceous, some of them become just freaking huge. Um, we also get things called mosasaurs, which we will talk about. Um, oh, is there a typo? No. Oh, okay, never mind. Okay. And apparently, I didn't know this, but apparently the Cretaceous is when true tardigrades show up, which I looked that up because I was curious. And this is when we see the first tardigrade fossils, um, which is interesting. That was for Steph because she wanted me to ask about tardigrades. They say that they probably showed up earlier than this, but we don't have any evidence of it. So they're like, apparently tardigrades show up in the Cretaceous. Um, which is crazy. You kind of think as tardigrades as these ancient creatures, but actually, could all things considered, they showed up relatively newer than a lot of other stuff. Um, so now we're going to talk, this was Melanie's pick, I believe, Elasmosaurus, which is a type of plesiosaur, but um, it lived in the Cretaceous. It was very large, um, 34 feet long, and its neck was 23 feet long. So its neck was like two thirds of its body. Um, and um, it was Rick's pick, I'm sorry, I got confused. Um, and it could not lift its neck out of the water like those old Loch Ness Monster pictures. They don't think it could really do that. Um, Sarah asked, what was the benefit of having a more neck than body? And that is a good question. And I have some guesses, but we don't know for sure. Um, it probably used its neck for mobility and hunting. So it would kind of keep its body still, but be able to move its neck around while underwater and grab at stuff. Um, and um, yeah, that's a Lasmosaurus. Pretty cool. <clears throat> um, also now we have Pteranodon, which is a true pterodactyloid um, and lived in the late Cretaceous, kind of middle late Cretaceous. Um, we think Pteranodon was very much like an albatross in terms of its lifestyle. Um, it probably did some dive feeding. It would have been like, if you ever see pelicans dive, it would have actually dove down our water to catch its food. Um, we definitely know it ate fish um, because we found fossil evidence of that. Um, but I think there, you see a lot of people kind of just always assume pterodactyls are eating fish. And we definitely don't think that's the case. We think pterodactyls are doing lots of different things, different types of pterosaurs, filled different niches and stuff. Um, but Pteranodon was very much that fish, albatross, pelican, fish thing, fish eating thing. Um, and there's evidence to support that it lived in kind of these offshore island rookeries like seabirds do today. So just all these ter ter pterosaurs on these islands, you know, huge groups, um, probably smelled terrible because it was covered in pterosaur crap. Um, anyway, uh, Colin asks, how big? Um, God, pretty big, <laughs> but um, I'm trying to think how big this one was. Like, bigger than maybe like condor sized, maybe even a little bigger, but definitely not the, there is a wingspan on record, I just don't know it off the top of my head. Um, but definitely not the biggest pterosaur by any uh, <laughs> Lawrence, how many dinner plates is that? Uh, I don't know. Uh, I'd have to look that up later. I don't actually know off the top of my head. Um, but this is Quetzalcoatlus which is the largest pterosaur ever. It lived right at the end. Um, oh, Sonia says about Pteranodon, the male was 18 feet, the female was 12 feet long. So as uh, according to Google, so pretty big. Um, however, Quetzalcoatlus was the biggest pterosaur uh, ever. Um, it was what's called an Asdarkid pterosaur, uh, probably the largest flying creature ever. There's a couple other Asdarkids that are also around the same size, um, but yeah, it's pretty freaking awesome and huge. It's one of my personal favorites. Um, it had a 36 foot wingspan, which is like the size of a small little like one or two person plane. Um, uh, and um, when it was walking around, it would have been as tall as a giraffe. So just imagine like a giraffe walking around and then the giraffe could like take off and fly away. It's crazy. Um, and um, we know based on the fossils that we've found that this one probably lived inland. It was not, the fossils are found actually in like Texas and stuff. Um, 
and um, yeah, so it was not like a seafaring one. It probably it like was very much like just a giant, uh, actually they say it was a lot like a stork. It probably had a stork type lifestyle. So it actually probably spent a lot of time on the ground um, eating stuff, but it could definitely fly when it, when it needed to. Um, they've done tests on it to see if it could fly and it definitely could. Um, and Jeannie asked if it delivered babies. And yes, Jeannie, that's what's happening. It's delivering this poor little sauropod baby. I'm sure that's what's happening in that picture. Um, and um, I said it was like a stork. Um, Colin asked specifically, could we ride this thing? And the funny thing is, Colin, somebody on a, on a dinosaur podcast I listened to asked that question. And the paleontologist good, said, good question. Yeah. And the paleontologist said, they thought about it and they said, well, probably not on its back, but maybe you could use it like a hang glider. So if you could train one <laughs> to be like your hang glider and it could like hold onto your bar with its feet or something, maybe you could. That is, that's the best possible answer. Thank you. <laughs> that's baller as shit. But um, yeah, Quetzalcoatlus is totally awesome. It's just one of my favorite things. Again, just to reiterate this point, not a dinosaur. It is an archosaur, but it's a pterosaur, so it is not a true dinosaur. Um, this is Cherish's pick. This is Yong Jing Long, which is a sauropod that made it through. Um, it lived in kind of the middle of Cretaceous. It was a medium-sized titanosaur. Um, so the titanosaurs are kind of the sauropods that make it through to the Cretaceous. Um, and again, the ones in South America get to be just full on gigantic. But uh, this one in China, honestly, is just kind of a medium sized one. Um, from China, I said that already. Um, I already said that the ones in South America became the largest land animals ever. Um, they're called Argentinosaurus. If somebody wants to look it up and say how big it was, go ahead. I'm not going to do it right now because I got to keep going. But yeah, they just get massive. Um, and now uh, we're going to talk about some theropods, some uh, paravians, if you will. This is Utah raptor, which is uh, lived in the early Cretaceous. It is my personal favorite dinosaur. Um, it is just totally awesome. Um, it is, Garrett says raptor red. That is correct. There is a book written by Robert Bacher about Utah raptors called Raptor Red. It's a great book. It will be on my book list when we're all done. Um, Jody says, Argentinosaurus, the sauropod that I was talking about just a second ago, was 98 to 130 feet long. So really, really, really damn big. Um, uh, anyway, back to Utah Raptor. It was probably because it was a little bigger. It wasn't as fast as the smaller Dromaeosaurids, um, but it was like an ambush predator. It would have been able to ambush things. Um, and um, this is kind of a bummer for everybody here, but uh, the idea of raptors being these like pack-like animals with alphas and you know all the different um, you know pack mentality like wolves, there's some evidence for that, but it's a little questionable, and it's kind of something that like has just kind of taken off in people's imaginations, but it's not necessarily true. It's a little up in the air. Um, and, um, but also, Utahraptor is really, really big. And a question is, why did it get so big? Um, and it's probably because in North America, anyway, the early Cretaceous, a lot of the big predators kind of died out, like Allosaurus. And there was kind of this empty niche. So some of these little Dromaeosaurids just got bigger because there was a space for it. And um, Colin asks, how big? Um, and it was basically more or less the size of the raptors in Jurassic Park. So most raptors were not that big. Um, they were much smaller. Um, and what's funny is when they were making Jurassic Park, the, um, they had never found a raptor that was that size. The largest was Dromaeosaur, well, sorry, the largest at the time was Dionychus, um, which uh, ooh, was about, you could like look a five-year-old or maybe, maybe like a, a seven-year-old in the eye, but it was not this huge raptor. And so like all these paleontologists got mad at Spielberg and then as he was making Jurassic Park, they were like, oh, we found a raptor that was that size. So um, I guess um, that it's okay now, sort of. Um, 
And uh, there were other raptors later on that were also pretty large. There's one in late Cretaceous called Dakota raptor that's pretty, pretty big. And there's like a couple others, but um, yeah, anyway. Uh, oh, and Raptor Red by Robert Bacher. It's a book. You should read it. It's great. Um, and we know it had high metabolism. Um, there's a whole Eons video that talks about dinosaur metabolism if you want to check it out. Everybody drink. <clears throat> um, this, was, this was Jen's pick, right? I think this was Jen's pick. Um, uh, this is Sin Ornithosaurus. It is uh, kind of later mid Cretaceous, um, like early middle Cretaceous uh, from China. And it was, this was the dinosaur, it was a really important find because this is the thing that made us know like for sure raptors had feathers because it's like a raptor, but the fossil is incredible. Um, look it up, but it's just like covered in feathers. Um, and um, it wasn't very big. This is a real small little guy. It's only three feet long. So there's a tiny little raptor. Um, looks real scary in the picture, but it's tiny. Um, and we know the colors, they are more or less correct. We know it from the melanosomes that it had orange, red, and black feathers. Um, it also had kind of longer feathers, so it possibly did a little bit of gliding. Um, and that's it for Sornithosaurus. <clears throat> um, now we're going to talk about the real Velociraptor. Um, which is obviously this guy and not this guy. Um, but there's a reason I have this picture and we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, so Brian says, uh. Jen says, Sinornithosaurus may also be poisonous. Um, Jen, I'm sorry, I got news for you. It probably wasn't. It was a cool theory, but they've kind of looked into it and now they don't think that's true. Sorry, Jen. Jen says, whatever. Hey, maybe it was, I don't know. Um, anyway, let's move on to Velociraptor. Um, its name means speedy thief, if you're curious. It lived in Mongolia, so in Jurassic Park when they're digging up Velociraptor in Montana or whatever, that's wrong. Um, it was about the size of a turkey, so it wasn't freaking huge. Um, so it was not a six-foot turkey, it was a turkey-foot turkey. Um, <laughs> and turkeys are pretty big though, it's true. Um, and so the reason I picked this picture is Velociraptor was, there is this type one Velociraptor that was found, like one of the coolest fossils ever, locked in combat with a protoceratops, and they both were like killed in a sandstorm and died together. So it's like, and the protoceratops is literally biting at the Velociraptor's hand, the Velociraptor is clawing on the protoceratops neck, and they like died together. Um, so it's kind of cool. It's like one of the, if you like look up the fossil, it's, it's one of the coolest fossils just ever. Really cool fossil. And um, another thing about raptors in general is in Jurassic Park, again, we kind of think of them all having these claws they would slash stuff with, which is what they thought for a long time. Maybe that's what they did, but we kind of now think they actually, if you guys know what a secretary bird is, does anybody know what a secretary bird is? Probably, maybe not. No, nobody knows. Anyway, it's a type of bird. It's this big, crazy looking bird that lives in Africa. Um, that's um, basically, it probably attacked things more like pinning them down and kicking them with its feet, and then kind of using the pinning of its back legs and its long claws to then attack the creature. So it kind of probably attacked differently than we're kind of used to it doing in the Jurassic Park movies a little bit. But that's up in the air a little bit. Um, they're figuring that out. Um, now, this is Kate's pick. I don't know if Kate made it. Is Kate here? Nope, maybe? Yeah, Kate, okay, I don't know. Um, uh, this was a real boy. Yes, Colin, this was a real boy. Spinosaurus is actually really cool. Um, in fact, I'm, not even, I'm gonna say it before I even click it. There's an Eons video all about Spinosaurus, if you're curious. And even that video is now out of date because like literally like three weeks ago, they re revealed some more stuff about this guy. And that's actually accurately shown in this picture. Um, but it was kind of middle Cretaceous. Um, so they had these fossils of this crazy dinosaur that were found by like a German paleontologist. And then in World War II, they all got bombed. And so they lost all the fossils. Um, Allison says, which one is it? Both of these, this is a Spinosaurus and this is a Spinosaurus. These are both Spinosaurus. 
Um, so they lost all the fossils. They got bombed in World War II. And then they didn't, so they just had like pic drawings of what the fossils looked like. And like, you'd see it in all the kids' books, but they were just like, I don't know, there's a Spinosaurus. It looks like a T-Rex with a sail on its back. And they didn't really know much about it. Um, uh, however, we found more fossils later and we were able to piece together. And like, I feel like every three years, they like now, especially they're like, they know and they kind of reveal a new thing about Spinosaurus. And it was super crazy. Um, it's in the running for the largest predatory dinosaur. It was certainly longer than T-Rex, but like T-Rex is probably heavier. Um, and um, it was built to be a swimmer in the rivers. So it kind of became this big dinosaur crocodile. And you can kind of see that from its like entire mouth. Um, and uh, didn't was very awkward on land. It kind of actually, which is crazy for a theropod, like walked almost on all fours and like was kind of just awkward and shuffled around on land. Um, but then when it went in the water, it would just been take off and swim around. Um, and they think at the front of its jaws, they are at its nose, it had like, they can tell by looking at the fossils that it has this kind of like sensory stuff that a crocodile has. So it was able to like sense movements in the water and stuff, just like a crocodile. Um, and um, also this is the newest thing that was revealed. It definitely had this like thick, like tail, like a big old rudder, like an eel or something has. So it's just like this huge dinosaur, like longer than T-Rex that swam around in the rivers and just ate fish. It was just like this big old crocodile. Colin says, do I need to go back and watch JP2? Uh, I think it's in JP3, Colin. Um, and um, like, that's the thing is in JP3, that was before they'd kind of figured all this stuff out. So it's like, you kind of see it like as this halfway point. Um, but I did like in JP3, as much as it's not a great movie, that they did put the Spinosaurus in the water. Like it is swimming around and attacking them in the water, which is kind of neat. Um, and that's because Robert Bacher, who knows what he's talking about for the most part, uh, was a consultant on that movie and he really liked Spinosaurus and wanted to show it off. Um, how many of these dino skulls can you play like a flute? Asks David. Uh, I don't know, David. That's up to you. I don't quite get the joke. Okay. Um, oh, and then there's a new announcement. I said it already. Um, oh, it's a Jurassic Park 3 reference because he plays it like a flute. Ah, right. Oh, I'm, it's been a while. Sorry. Um, all right, this is one I threw in there because it's one of my favorites and nobody knows anything about it. But I want you guys to look at this dinosaur and tell me what do you think this dinosaur, what, what is this dinosaur related to? I want you guys to give me some guesses. Collins says chicken, witches, bird, platypus, <laughs> Freddy Krueger, Satan, brontosaurus, Okay, um, turkey. So um, this is a Therizinosaurus, um, lived in Asia, in the middle Jurassic, actually late Jurassic. Um, it was 30 feet long, so it's pretty, pretty big, pretty big. Um, Garrett asked, didn't Robert Bacher get eaten in Jurassic Park 2? And yeah, there's a guy that looks like Robert Bacher and they totally get him get eaten by a T-Rex. Um, and, um, so as a theropod, which remember most theropods are like raptors and T-Rex and stuff, but this is one that became herbivorous. So even though it's this big feathery theropod -like thing with these giant claws, it actually ate plants. Um, and um, it confused paleontologists for a very long time. Like if you look at books from like when I was a kid, they actually don't even call it, they call it Segnosaurus because there are other types that were called Segnosaurus. And they'd like always have this chapter that are just like, hey, we don't know what this is. It's a dinosaur. We don't know where it fits. Like it actually confused them for a very long time. Um, but as they found more, they figured it out. Um, but it had these giant claws, which were three feet long to use for defense. Um, and so personally, I really want one of these to show up in like a Jurassic Park movie because they're so weird. Nobody really knows them. And I think you could do something really cool with them. I mean, they're like herbivores, but they would freaking tear you up. They'd be so awesome. I mean, they're really big, they're covered in feathers, they're just bizarre. Um, and uh, anyway, or a Jurassic World movie, says Brian. Um, but yeah, 
I love there isn't a source, and it's one that nobody really knows much about your general person, so I always want to kind of throw it in there. And now we're going to talk about T-Rex. Um, oh, I, I did say what it's related to. It's, um, it's really, so it's a theropod. It's related to the raptors. It's related to, um, to the uh, T-Rex and stuff. It's on that side of things, even though it kind of looks like a mixture of all these other things. Um, yeah. Um, so now T-Rex um, lived right at the end of things. Um, it means tyrant lizard king. I feel like a lot of you guys know this one already. Um, it is definitely one of the biggest. There's a few other dinosaurs or carnosaurs, like big meat-eating dinosaurs that get close, um, but it's in the running. It's like there's like four and they're all really big and they're all like about the same size. Um, you know, there's T-Rex is up there for sure. Still pretty awesome. Um, which one is the T-Rex, asked Cherish. Uh, this one is Cherish. These guys I didn't really talk about, but these are ornithomimosaurs. Um, they're also on the theropod side of things, but they're like little ostrich guys. Um, <laughs> um, and um, so this is interesting. Uh, you'll notice this T-Rex has a little bit of feathers on it, but um, we don't know if T-Rex had feathers or not because we found skin impressions from T-Rex that definitely show it's, um, we'll get to the arms in a minute, guys. <laughs> um, that definitely show it's uh, like got pebbly, like reptilian skin. Um, so, but then we know now for sure that ancestors of T-Rex, other tyrannosaurids, like its direct ancestors, were covered in feathers. So, um, I don't know, maybe, I kind of think it was something like, this is my guess personally, it's, it might have been like an elephant today where elephants barely have hair but have a little bit because it got so big it maybe didn't need those feathers to keep it warm at all. Um, but we don't really know, it's kind of crazy. Um, but I definitely think if you see drawings of T-Rex which is like feathers everywhere, I think that's wrong. I definitely like think it, we know it had skin, like uh, skin impressions that were scaly. So who knows? Um, we know it had good smell and good eyesight. Um, we know it was very adapted to hearing low frequency sounds. It probably didn't do the big roar that we see in the movies all the time. It probably like was more like an alligator with these big booming sounds and stuff to communicate. Um, the vision based on movement question um, is total bullshit and it's something that Michael Crichton made up to be kind of like fun and scary, but that's not a thing. T-Rex could totally see you and it could smell you. It would totally get you. Um, it was, so unlike Allosaurus, which was kind of biting and slashing, T-Rex was a bone crusher. It had a crazy powerful bite. It would just bite you and crush you. It was just, <sighs> just totally crush the crap out of you. That's, and then take a big old bite and then you just would die. Like, or if you were an herbivore, like you would die. It just would be that bone crushing thing. So like today, actually there are, um, a good comparison is like hyenas actually attack through bone crushing. That's what they're built to do. Um, so, um, yeah, anyway. Um, it had these tiny little arms. Um, we, people just ask about the arms. Um, it's a question that they don't really know. Um, they've done like studies where it had pretty, these arms, even though they're small, were still like strong arms. Like they could probably not be used for attack, but maybe if it was like sleeping, it could help it like push back up off the ground. There's even a theory that they used them like to like, you know, tickle each other when they were getting it on. Like, we don't know, but they were strong enough to like be useful. We just don't know what they used them for. Um, <laughs> Jack and Alice say, wait, what? Elaborate uh, about the arms. So yeah, I will. Um, well, I'll take a drink beforehand. So has someone made T-Rex porn, Sarah asks. Um, yes, they have, because many people have been like, Dan, check this out, and I have not watched it, but I know it exists. Um, and um, anyway, uh, so the arms. So. Sharks have a thing called claspers. 
So when sharks breed, they have to grab onto each other and they have these little appendages called claspers and they think T-Rex might have done the same thing. It might have used them to kind of just hold onto each other. Lauren says, send us the link, Stan. That will not be in your uh, links that I send you with all the Eon videos at the end of the talk, I'm sorry. I'm sure it wouldn't be hard to find if you wanna go look for it. <clears throat> um, John, uh, yes, John asked about Sue. Um, which is a famous 90% complete specimen of a T-Rex. Um, it was a big legal battle even to get the bones. It's kind of crazy. It's in Chicago now. Um, and Sue was 28 years old when she died. Um, and looking at the bones, like being a T-Rex was not easy. There's all these wounds that were broken and then rehealed. It had arthritis. She had gout. Um, being a predator in the Mesozoic was tough. And I mean, it makes sense. You look at all the dinosaurs you have to eat and they're all really tough too. Like it was, um, yeah. Anyway, um, not easy. And actually that's true for Allosaurus too. A lot of Allosaurus fossils also just are beat to crap. Like it was not easy being a predatory dinosaur. Like tough time. Everything had all these spikes and horns and things and would beat the crap out of you. Um, anyway, let's move on from T-Rex. Um, we're going to talk about, I think this is Chris Ortiz's pick. I don't know if Chris is here or not. Um, but, uh, okay, Chris, this is yours. This is Ankylosaurus. So it's one of those thyreophorans we talked about earlier, but this is the other branch, the Ankylosaurus. Uh, lived at the, this one specifically lived right at the end of the Cretaceous. Um, and Ankylosaurus was a really big one, probably one of the biggest, about 20 to 26 feet long. Jen asks, are all these pictures anatomically correct? Um, and Jen, I tried to pick ones that were, I did my best. There are always going to be little things that are off here and there. I just used the internet. I didn't credit in my sources. I just found shit and threw it into, uh, into PowerPoint. Um, but, uh, bye, the Winosaurs. I believe that's Melanie and John. Um, uh, but yeah, I tried to pick ones that are pretty up to date. I did the best I could. Um, and I tried to pick ones that were generally pretty cool. Um, oh, and Ellie, bye Ellie. <clears throat> um, protective armor and tail club for defense. So Ankylosaurus had all this armor all over it, had a big fat old tail club. And um, it also, they think Ankylosaurus, by looking at it's kind of the way its nose is placed and also its front legs and things and how it was built, they think maybe it was kind of digging. It would probably like maybe look for tubers and roots and things. And that's kind of a specific niche it filled. That's a little up to question, but they, think that's kind of what it uh, filled. And bye, Steph is leading too. Bye, Steph. Thank you. <clears throat> um, now we're on to another ornith the ornithopods. We kind of talked about them. We didn't get into any species. Um, we're going to talk about Iguanodon, which I believe is Ivana's pick. Um, lived in the Middle Cretaceous. Um, it was the first dinosaur ever discovered in 1822. Um, and um, and it had grinding teeth. Iguanodon had behind these jaws, it had like all these dental batteries that could just grind food up real well. So it was a herbivore, but it was really good to crush and grind stuff up. Um, Sorry, I interrupt. You want some time? Uh, yes, please. That'd be great. Um, and um, its thumb spike was maybe used for defense. It had this weird spiky thumb. Um, maybe it could use a defense, although compared to like full on horns and spikes and stuff, it's not really quite as impressive. Um, and uh, there's evidence to support that Iguanodon lived in herds. Again, by looking at the trackways and stuff, it seems like it might have been in some, some reasonably sized herds. Um, and oh, Steph left and missed her dinosaur, uh, Saurolophus. Um, so this is a, kind of along the same path of Iguanodon, but in the later Cretaceous, some of them got these interesting crests and things. Um, and um, this is actually, if we're going to talk about the land before time, this is what ducky is. Um, thank you. Um, and um, what? Who? Gladys? No, Wheatley. Oh, what do you? Okay. Um, I, didn't, I, didn't, I, didn't, I, didn't, I was like, oh. Um, Garrett asks, "Is ducky a myosaur?" Um, honestly, if you, I think not. Myosaur didn't really have the crest. If you look at ducky's parents, ducky's parents have the crest. Um, but myosaur is another one of these um, hadrosaurs. Um, and we actually know for a fact that myosaur cared for its, its babies, um, which is why this one is also shown caring for its babies, different type. Um, 
it's good enough of a hadrosaur, which are the more advanced of like of the ornithopods that came kind of in a later Cretaceous. Um, the crests developed as they grew up. So as babies, they didn't really have the crests. And then as they grew up, they got the crests. Um, and so a lot of different hadrosaurs had these elaborate crests and they kind of got bigger as they grew. Uh, and uh, it would be maybe used in like sexual displays and stuff like that to show off the other ones. Um, Colin says like deer, they're very much. As I said, they're kind of just the deer of the Mesozoic. Um, their uh, teeth were even more better at grinding up than um, iguanodons. They were kind of a little more advanced than the iguanodons. Um, and they also maybe had skin flaps over these crests, um, which could be used to kind of call out to each other and make these sounds and maybe call, you know, get each other's attention or that sort of thing. Um, if you look up parasaurolophus sounds, so not saurolophus, but parasaurolophus, they've actually done simulations to try to see what it actually sounded like. Um, which is super cool. Um, and difference between Saurolophus and Parasaurolophus, ask Garrett. Uh, they're just different species. Parasaurolophus had a really long, long crest. So imagine this, but like three times longer and thicker. And um, it's, it, it's just a stupid naming thing. They were both hadrosaurs. They weren't that closely related to each other than any others, but they found Saurolophus first and then found Parasaurolophus, and when they found it, they thought they were like, you know, real closely related, which they were, but not, again, not that closely related. And um, Parasaurolophus just means besides Saurolophus. They did live around like at the same time, so they would have been like in the same habitat and stuff, um, but they're just different species. They look very much the same kind of thing, it's just that they have different shaped heads and different shaped crests. Um, which is kind of a thing with hadrosaurs. A lot of hadrosaurs just basically look the same, but they have different crests. <clears throat> so now we're going to talk about the last group of dinosaurs that we haven't really touched on yet, which are the marginocephalians, which is just a big word that are the ones with the headgear. So you get all the ceratopsians, they're kind of two groups of ceratopsians, all these different kinds of ceratopsians, so lots of different kinds, and all these different kinds of pachycephalosaurians. Um, and they only lived in North America and Asia. They never really made it down to the lower continents. Um, and actually, well, we'll get into this. So this is kind of a, it's a cool picture because it sees all these different kinds, but they sort of think some of these are actually the young versions of the adults. So they actually think this might be a young version of this. Um, they think this might be a young version of that. Um, maybe, they're debating that, but there's evidence to support that maybe they aren't this many, these aren't all different species. Um, uh, the fact, is it due to temperature in the environments that they didn't get into the south? Uh, that's a good question. Um, I don't think so. I think it's just because um, the continents were separating and these ones evolved. I think they, they kind of think they evolved in Asia and moved into North America, but they, um, it was much, you know, they just didn't make it to the southern continents because it was hard to get there. That's why the um, Blade asks about, I'll explain that in a minute, Blade, don't worry. Um, again, that's why the sauropods in South America were able to just become really cool and crazy is because South America got kind of isolated. And so those sauropods were able to diversify on their own and do other things. Um, what time is it? How am I doing here? Oh boy, this went on a while, huh? Um, we're getting there. <clears throat> um, keep going, says Allison. We're almost there. We're almost at the end of the Cretaceous, and that means we're almost done. But we have a little more to go after that. Um, so we're going to talk about an example of a Pachycephalosaur is Pachycephalosaurus. Um, it lived right at the end of the Cretaceous. I'm having a great time. I just want to make sure everybody's not bored. And since I can't hear you, I sometimes worry you're not bored. You're getting bored. Um, but um, okay, great. So, Pachycephalosaurus, end of the Late Cretaceous. Um, it means thick-headed lizard, because it had this big old thick head. Um, we know it had good eyesight by looking at its skull. It looks like it was a pretty, pretty good at looking at things. Um, and um, as I kind of said before, as, when it was younger, it had a flatter dome that kind of grew up curved as it grew. Um, and did it butt heads for competition and defense? We'll get in. So yeah, so that's a question that you always see it like bigghorn sheep ramming each other. 
And for a while, that's what they first thought. And then paleontologists changed their mind and said, no, their heads wouldn't, they weren't built for that. They would, it would beat them up too much. Maybe they just bonked each other in the butts and like in the sides and kind of, you know, headbutted each other, but not like directly. Um, and, um, but then they did more studies and looked at the skulls and actually were like, mm, actually, yeah, their skulls are actually pretty tough. They probably could. Um, and uh, the other thing is they know that their spines could kind of lock into place when they went down to like ram at something. So they probably did. It's my guess is that maybe they didn't always bonk each other right in the heads, but they maybe were always kind of knocking each other around and stuff. Um, and <laughs> yeah, um, that's very funny, Anna. Um, yeah, Lisa says like goats. And I think that's great. Like goats, sometimes they bonk each other in the heads, but they often are just bonking each other. Um, also, one thing that in this picture, you'll notice they gave these guys kind of spiky stuff along its tail. Um, there's no proof of that, but as I said, these or I talked about how these were related to the ceratopsians. We know some early ceratopsians um, definitely had like quilly bushy tails, like almost like a porcupine-y kind of thing. So I think that is why they, that's why they put them on this one. Um, but we don't know that for sure, but it's possible. We know that, like, we're learning a lot lately that more and more dinosaurs had weird feathery things on them, even some of the herbivores that weren't directly related to birds. Um, so, uh, that is Pachycephalosaurus. Now we'll talk about Triceratops. A lot of people's favorites, and definitely one of my favorites too. I love Triceratops. Um, lived right at the end of the Cretaceous. And um, it means three-horned face, for obvious reasons. Um, it was one of the largest ceratopsians. It was about 30 feet long. And there were some also about the same size, but it was a pretty big one. Um, its teeth with lots of very sharp shearing teeth. So whereas the iguanodontids and the hadrosaurs were kind of grinding, you can think of Triceratops' teeth almost being like scissors. So it was like they were more made for like cutting. Um, so still really good at tearing apart plants, but a slightly different way of doing it. Um, and the horns and frill were used probably to catch each other's attention and used in courtship, and you know also probably for defense. Um, I feel like Triceratops is one of these dinosaurs that like is really cool, but I feel like everybody knows everything about it already. Um, there's not like any surprise Triceratops things. Um, uh, anyway. Um, Sometimes now you're starting to see it with a little bit of quills on its tails too, because we know its ancestors had those, but we don't know that for sure. Um, and that's it for the dinosaurs, guys. We are done with the dinosaurs, but we are not done with the talk. We are moving a little past the dinosaurs now. Um, which means I'm gonna pour one out for the other dinosaurs. So we have the Cretaceous Paleogene extinction, the end of the dinosaurs. Um, an asteroid hit the Yucatan Peninsula. Uh, if anybody tries to tell you otherwise, that's wrong. We've, at this point, we totally know that's what killed the dinosaurs. Like we figured it out. That's totally what happened. Um, and um, there is whoever, there might be a little more if you want some. I'll make some more. Okay. Jeannie's trying to get me drunk. Um, there is some evidence that dinosaurs, <laughs> dinosaurs were having a bit of trouble before the extinction. Um, it's funny because we know, like all of everybody's favorite dinosaurs, like Triceratops and Ankylosaurus and Tyrannosaurus um, and Pachycephalosaurus and even Quetzalcoatlus, all lived at the like very end. Um, but it is true that it, like those just happen to be the flashy ones. But if you look at the fossil record there is a decline in diversity happening right before that. Um, so the question is, I don't, I, think, I don't think that they would have gone extinct. I think they just, maybe there was some environmental stuff happening that was giving a little bit of a hard time. Um, and, um, or it's also just possible they were doing fine and it's just a weird moment in the fossil record that we just don't have as much fossils from. Sometimes that happens too. Um, Ivana says it was probably plants. Yeah, probably. Um, <laughs> 
So anyway, it's possible they were kind of in trouble, but certainly the big freaking asteroid did not help. Um, and um, however, it was not just the dinosaurs that got wiped out. Um, all the ammonites, which I didn't really talk about, but basically they're squids with shells and they were like around since way before the dinosaurs. Um, they got wiped out. And all tetrapods, um, larger than 55 pounds, went extinct. So um, amniote, am ammonite, asked Colin, ammonite are big squids with shells, um, shell squids. Yes, like almost star from Pokemon. Um, yep. Uh, like a Nautilus. Yeah, so actually I guess Nautilus made it through, but one that made it through. Um, but most ammonites, almost all of them, most of them died. Um, and in any tetrapod, which you should know what a tetrapod is, but that's, we're tetrapods. Anything that was larger than 55 pounds died, except for some turtles and crocs. And even crocs, like, again, I talked about how crocs were doing lots of different things. Um, and that happened all through the Mesozoic. And, um, and uh, basically all the other interesting crocs died. The only ones that made it through were like your basic river crocodile. So um, yeah, it was a bad time. Um, and the same thing goes for birds and mammals. Like mammals, there were lots of other types of early mammals that were kind of a little different. They still kind of just looked like rats, but there were some that were pretty big. There were some like badger sized. Um, and a lot of those died out too. Even birds, there were many different early kinds of prehistoric birds and basically only one or two groups made it through. Um, and um, they were kind of the ones that were really small and ate seeds, which probably was really helpful to survive off of. Um, and um, so 75% of all species go extinct. So it's not as bad as the great dying, um, but um, bye, bye Ryan. Um, but yeah, it's not as bad as the great dying in the Permian, but it's still pretty, pretty bad. Um, Colin asked the biggest croc. Colin, there's a croc called Dinosuchus, um, and it was really, really big. It was like, ooh, look it up. I want to say 40, 40 feet long, something like that. It's pretty damn big. I would double check that, but um, yeah. Um, also, there's a very good Radio Lab episode about this extinction that I will link to when we're all done here, and you can check that out. Um, about the extinction. Oh my gosh, look at our big old map or our chart. Um, so we talked about the pterodactyloids and the rampyrinkids and uh, um, pteranodon and quetzalcoatlus are both pterodactyloids. It's kind of hard to put them on the right spot, but they are not rampyrinkids. They are pterodactyloids, they're over here. Um, we talked about the paravians. We got Utahraptor, we got Sinornithosaurus, we got Velociraptor, they're all paravians. Um, which are a type of theropod. Um, we got Spinosaurus here, we got Therizinosaurus, we got Tyrannosaurus, um, and then we got the Stegosaurus and Ankylosaurus and branched off, and we got Ankylosaurus over here. Um, we got Iguanodon as one of the ornithopods, we got Saurolophus over here. Um, we got the Marginocephalans, which is a new thing we added, the armored ones. Um, one of those is Ceratopsians, and we got Triceratops over there. Um, the other ones are the Pachycephalosaurians. And we got Pachycephalosaurus right there. Um, we got the Plesiosaur, um, which, you know, they survived. They kind of just have the same more or less look uh, all through, but uh, we got a Lasmosaurus over here. Um, the Pliosaurs, as I said, they don't make it. They, they make it through a lot of the Cretaceous, but they die out. Same thing with the Ichthyosaurs. Um, and they die out, and I wonder why that might be. And perhaps, maybe we don't know, but over here, um, we have the squamates, which are just your lizards. And we talked about the snakes, how they evolve in the lake, middle lake Cretaceous. Um, but also we have the thing called mosasaurs, which I didn't show any pictures of, but they're also big um, marine reptiles. Uh, and they get really big and real nasty. They're actually very close to the monitor lizards, we think. But um, it's possible that the mosasaurs, especially when you look at how it all lines up, maybe they were better at living in the water than these ones, and maybe they kind of outcompeted them. Um, and also, 
Uh, you guys are digging me on me for plants. And hey, um, excuse me, if you'll notice, I talked about the Jurassic plants and how they got the big redwood forest here. And then if you look here, I have more plants and I added all these little flowery things to show that it was, you know, getting angiosperms and stuff. So guys, we're not done done because we're gonna talk about what happened afterwards very quickly, but that is the Mesozoic. That is a big, big, um, that is the big main chunk of the things. And boy, did it take longer than I thought it was going to. Um, so, uh-oh. Oh, there we go. Post-dinosaurs, the Cenozoic. Um, which means, ah, new life. Um, and uh, we're gonna talk about what happened in the Cenozoic a little bit. Enough a little bit. Um, uh-oh. There we go. Uh, we have, this is Anna's pick. Uh, Anna's still here. Yay, Anna picked the Paleodiptinae, which are a group of giant penguins that were really, really big, big old penguins. Not the human, the human was just there for a fun drawing. Um, uh, and, um, oh man, why is it? There we go, giant early penguins, I said that. Um, what's interesting is it does show that birds so everybody kind of thinks of the Cenozoic as the time that mammals just took over. And that's not really true. Everything kind of did different things. Um, and the birds were like trying things out and became giant penguins. And um, the largest was uh, Paleodiptinides, I believe. And that's this one here. And it was seven feet tall. It was a seven foot tall penguin. Um, <laughs> shape of water too. Uh, there's a whole eons, Anna, about these penguins. So you can learn all about these penguins. I mean, Yes, aside from what I just told you. Um, this, I believe, was Gwen's pick. I'm not sure. Um, Paracerotherium uh, lived in the Oligocene, which came after the Eocene. Um, it's a giant hornless rhino. It was the largest mammal to ever live. It was real, real big. Um, it's a rhino. It's not a horse. It's a rhino. Um, it was 16. There's actually a lot of, a little bit of a, debate about how big it was, but real big. It was probably about 16 feet at the shoulder and 24 feet long. Um, so it was really, really big, real big. Um, I don't have anything more about it. It's really cool though. Paracetherium is pretty, pretty, pretty boss. Um, this is Lauren's pick, Leviathan Melvilli, which is this one here. Um, and it was lived in the Miocene. Um, it was a killer sperm whale, Colin's worst nightmare. Um, it is named after Moby Dick, yep, um, or the author of Moby Dick. It, it had the largest biting teeth of any known animal aside from like walrus tusks. Um, and um, it also lived at the same time as Megalodon, the giant shark I'm sure you've all heard of, um, which is, freaking crazy that you could go in the ocean and either of these things would attack you. Um, however, I'm gonna talk really quickly about that. It's probably, Megalodon they think probably was a shallow seas hunter. And they, this guy was probably a deep water hunter. They probably fit in different niches, but they still probably ran into each other every once in a while. I mean, come on. Um, it ate seals and smaller whales, this thing. So like, crazy. It's a whale that eats other whales. Um, it likely went extinct due to some cooling at the end of the Miocene that made the food populations drop. Um, and also, I want to pop an Eons plug. Evolution of whales is real neat. Um, it's um, like basically whales come from a group of hoofed animals called mesonychids, some of which were carnivorous. It's this crazy, and then some of those became like crocodile seal things and then eventually became whales. It's this crazy weird evolution that is really neat. So um, anyway, uh, yeah, whale evolution, check it out on eons. <clears throat> um, let's talk about the La Brea tar pits because they're right over here. Um, they have fossils that go up to 38,000 years ago, which is the Pleistocene. Um, it's a predator trap, which means that animals would go into the tar pits and get stuck. And then all the big old saber-toothed cats and dire wolves and things would um, 
go check and think, oh, this mammoth, I don't usually get to eat a mammoth because they're so big, but this one's easy. I'm going to eat it. And then they get stuck. And another stuff would get stuck. And everything would get stuck. Um, by the way, aside, I see some of you saying I've never been to the tar pits. That is actually what I want to do for my birthday this year. That was my plan, was to go to the tar pits. And it will have to happen another year. Um, but someday. I've we'll never been, and I desperately want to go. It's really fun. Um, I haven't been in a while, so I wanted to check it out again. Um, what did David say? David said something questionable. Oh, very funny. <laughs> OK. Um, the targets contain mammoth, spice, and camels, antelope, giant vultures, direwolves, short faced bears, ground sloths, saber toothed cats, and one human, among other things. Um, lots of cool stuff in the tar pits. Um, this is Megatherium. This was, I think, Alicia's pick, or maybe David's pick. I can't remember. Um, it lived 5 million years ago to 10,000 years ago. Um, so the Pliocene, the early Holocene. Um, oh, David was Utah Raptor, you're right. Um, <laughs> and um, this specific species of giant ground sloth actually wasn't found in the tar pits, but other species were. So I'm just, that's why I put it after the tar pits. Um, this Megatherium is the largest ground sloth. It was big as an elephant. It was a big old sloth, as big as an elephant. Um, and um, only some mammoths and Paraceratum were larger. It's one of the largest land mammals ever. Um, and um, ground sloths, what's up? Oh, thank you. Uh, lived in uh, South America. That's where sloths are from, as I'm sure you maybe know. Um, but there's this thing called the Great Biotic Interchange that happens in the Pleistocene where the sea levels are rising and dropping and rising and dropping because the glaciers are coming and going. And um, in that time, a lot of stuff from North America goes down to South America, a lot of stuff from South America goes up into North America. And so you get kind of a lot of crazy cross stuff happening, new animals come into new environments and shake up things. And so um, ground sloths were in South America and they came up to North America, which is why we have them in our tar pits. Yes, GLaDOS, we're going to get to your ancestor sort of next. Um, and um, also sloths were really crazy and diverse. Now we kind of just have the ones that live in trees, but there's all these crazy different kinds of sloths. And there's even one kind of sloth, maybe even more, that were like marine sloths that like swam around in the water. like. Um, there are no air sloths. There are no air bending sloths or water bending sloths or fire bending sloths. Um, but there were marine sloths. Um, um, yes, Jenna, I don't know why I thought I could do this in an hour. What the hell was I thinking? Um, uh, now we're going to talk about Smilodon, which I think was tied for the most popular pick. I think Stegosaurus and Smilodon were the two number one picks. Um, uh, Smilodon lived uh, in the Pleistocene, the early Holocene. It is California's state fossil. Um, and um, remember how I talked about way long ago, how the Gorgonopsorids had those big tusks? Um, so saber teeth have showed up many times um, throughout history. Uh, they have the Gorgonopsorids, we have the these Smilodons. There's a group of marsupials in Australia that had saber, -tooth, saber teeth. There's another type of cat that had saber teeth. So it's clearly something that was good to evolve, but we still don't really quite know how it worked. Um, and it just seems like it was a more specialized form of hunting because the bite was actually pretty fragile, at least with this one. Um, maybe it required more caring for the kittens and family dynamics than lions need. Um, and like, it was probably a more like, I've got you, I've subdued you, and now I'm gonna stab you right in the throat with my teeth. Um, Problem. Maybe. Like, they're still not really sure how they hunted, but they clearly, it's a clearly a strategy that works. Um, and they came from North America and went into South America. So they did the opposite of the sloths um, during the Great Vatic Interchange. And there's a whole Eons video about saber toothed cats. Um, and so now here's the Cenozoic. Um, and I kind of very loosely put the guys sort of where they belong. It's a little loose. I didn't get as specific with these guys. Um, and now we're going to talk very quickly about the end of the Ice Age. Um, 
there's kind of three theories about what happened to the Ice Age. Um, there's overkill, which is like, did humans coming into North America, oh, North America, coming into everywhere, because humans were in Africa for a long time, and then they finally kind of late the game moved out to the rest of the continents. Did that do in a lot of these giant, large animals? Um, and um, Ryan, don't worry, I'll talk about the, the island of the mammoths. Um, uh, but um, yeah, so uh, I think this is definitely at least a piece of the equation um, because everywhere, even in like places like Australia, where they have all these large marsupials and the giant moas in New Zealand, you see all these big, beautiful giant animals and then like people show up and then like a short while later, boom, they all get knocked out. Um, and like the only place we have pretty big megafauna now is Africa. And there's at least one theory that like African animals had time to adapt with humans because that's where early humans were showing up. And so they learned to kind of deal with it. Whereas the rest of the world didn't, um, that's at least the theory, but yeah, I'm sure people did not help out all these megafauna dying off. So, um, there's overkill, there's overchill, which is climate change. It is true that there was a lot of climate change stuff happening at the end of the Ice Age, and maybe that changed things up. Um, and then there's over ill, which I sort of doubt, but there's a possibility that maybe there was disease that took out some of these, um, which is very timely for us today. But um, I don't think it really fits because it's always just the megafauna for the most part. Why would this thing only take out megafauna and not other things? It doesn't really hold water. I don't think it really works. Um, uh, there's also a theory um, that my dad is actually finding information to support, although he's not like proposing the theory himself. Um, but perhaps there was a small extraterrestrial impact that kind of knocked out the Ice Age. Um, and I didn't really buy it at first, but there's more and more evidence supporting that there may be something small hit Canada and kind of shocked the world, which caused the climate change and um, knocked out the megafauna. Because as we've seen with the dinosaurs, megafauna doesn't do well in an asteroid. Um, we'll see, we'll find out. Maybe we'll learn more as time goes on. I think it's probably some combination of all of these things, except for overhill. I think that's unlikely. Um, question that I believe Jess asked is, where can I find fossils in California? Um, and uh, the short answer is like anywhere. There's fossils wherever you want to look, really. Um, one spot are these trilobites, the Marble Mountains, which is up by um, the, um, oh God, up in the Mojave somewhere in like San Bernardino County, somewhere there's a place where there's lots of trilobites. I've been there a long time ago. Um, and the tar pits, you can volunteer as soon as you can go anywhere. And I think they will let you help sort through their stuff, I believe. I'm not sure on that, though. Um, and then also the Channel Islands, which I've been to many times off our coast, um, have pygmy mammoth fossils, um, which are like mammoths that are like the size of like ponies, um, because things on islands, if they're big, tend to get small. And there's a whole eons about those Channel Islands. Um, and uh, yeah. I love those channel islands. I've been to them a billion times. I'll talk about them forever, but not for this talk. Um, would you like to know more? Um, there is a book and YouTube list incoming. We're basically done. Any questions? Let's hang. That's the end of my dino talk. How do I stop recording? Is it still recording? Stop recording. <laughs>